and welcome to the 28th episode of Keen Minds. I'm Jen, a.k.a. Takata Cycle. And I am Tessa from Criminally Sane. And we are very excited about this one. Oh my we're, gosh. <laughs> we're discussing um, uh, Blacklist Redemption episode 6 called Hostages. And it was fantastic. I tell you, I think that Redemption is going to make one of the best binge watches of all times. Yeah, I, I'm just going to go back and continue binge watching it. Like, I, I have very high hopes for the episodes coming back on Blacklist. I know that because I'm, I'm super excited. They just released a, a preview for the Dimbe Zuma one, and it looks like a wild ride, and I'm just on the edge of my seat for it. But I'm still gonna go back and like back to back rewatching Blacklist and then rewatching Retention episodes. <laughs> yeah, I my my plans for the summer include a full Blacklist rewatch with with uh, Redemption in the middle of the way it was. It's just I was taking this one is bringing a lot of the of the lines even for the Blacklist like all together. It's like all coming like like a wave into it like like I, okay. Of- as the parallel fan that I am, there it was like being in a little slice of heaven for me. Like I, we have it on our, we have a list of notes we go through each week, and we've got the parallels at the end because save the best for last. But just know, at the end of the <laughs> at the end of the podcast, I'm gonna get really excited over these parallels. <laughs> oh yeah, and I have I have some that you don't have, so it's going to be wild parallel ride. Um, let's start by Tasty. Ah, oh, Dumont. I just, I just wanted to hug him at the end of that episode. He, well, he had, he had great moments on this one. Oh yeah, definitely. When he, when he, Scotty asked him to do something, and and he's starting to ask, I got something, you know, for you, and he says, I don't, I'm allergic to, to. Um, of course, I'll go selfish. on a date with you, Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> I was just rolling during that whole scene. She's just looking at him like, no, no, back to where we're supposed to be. And he's just off talking about their... Yeah, pick me up at 8.30. It's... I love it how comfortable this team is together. I I honestly, as as sketchy as Scotty can be at times, I think it says a lot for her as a character, as a leader, that her team is so comfortable around her. They respect Mm -hmm. her as a leader... When she says jump, they ask how high, but they're also comfort. It's not like she's just a leader. They talk to her. They confide in her. They joke with her. Mm-hmm. It's it says a lot about the way she runs her her gray matters team, and I love that both about her and about the team that's been built. Yes, yeah, I I I agree. And 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 Dumont has that that fantastic scene. I mean, what that that anguish when he you know when he's trying you know he, he, he knows who it is and he doesn't want to tell her but just he still has a loyalty to scotty so there is something about to be said for somebody who commands that kind of loyalty and you know that solomon makes makes it be like he's for the highest uh bidder but i don't believe that but dumont it seems like is you know he doesn't even try to pretend is is because he has he has he believes in her even oh, yeah. though he may say she knows more than he says, he's always looking at everything, yet the loyalty is to her. Well, I mean, that's because that's the kind of person you need in a position like the CEO of a major intelligence corporation. You have to have someone that's always two or three or four or five steps ahead of everybody else. It's always looking at every angle and that knows more than everybody around you. Because in mm. the intelligence game, knowledge is power. It's yeah. it's the same reason that Red and Howard both told Tom, do not tell Scotty who you are. It's because he had that information, and because he had it and Scotty didn't, that's power yeah. over her. And that is and that is something that I've always said about Wrestler. It's not that Wrestler is, is an idiot, of course not. He's a highly intelligent cop, not intelligence. And that's why he never keeps his knowledge to himself. He <laughs> gives the power away. And that's why he looks at Hitchin in the face and goes, I'm coming for you. And you're like, yeah. no, And Hitchin is like, yeah, it. sure. <laughs> don't uh, announce yeah, but it. But going, going back to the mod, the last thing, I, I'm always now looking for the tasty. Because I know that in each episode, 
Dumont's going to get a taste in. And uh, this one did not disappoint me. He's talking about the tympanic bursting device. An answer to the eternal question, can you hear me now? The ultrasonic frequency is so high, you may not even hear it, but you know when it's activated. Tasty. It's just, I mean, it was just perfect. And now, I mean, I, everybody knows that he's going to say it. I, at least I know, and I'm waiting for it. And he never, he never, ever disappoints it. Oh, and I just, I love how Adrian's owned that on Twitter, too. I just, mm-hmm. he hashtags everything that he posts is tasty now. And I'm like, tasty. It just makes me smile. Yeah. But something yeah, else... He, Something else was... I love about Dumont, and it's it wasn't something in this particular episode, it's just one of those things that I've, I've noticed throughout, and I'm going to probably do a, a, a um, full gift set once the season's over. But he, have you noticed how, with all these little things, these are his inventions that they use. He goes, this is my take on. You know, mm-hmm. like, he'll take something and he'll make it better. He will, mm-hmm. he will make a better version of something that's already there for Halcyon. Mm-hmm. And so, I would love... To see, because you saw he and Dum- or he and Dumont, he and Aram bounce off of each other a little bit in season three. Mm-hmm. I just want to see both of those. Like, I want to see Aram come over to Halcyon and be able to play with all the toys and mm-hmm. watch how excited Aram gets over <laughs> over geeking out with Dumont over Dumont's inventions. Yeah, I would love to see them like collaborating on on creating something just for for an operation or something like. And I think we're gonna get there. I mean, uh. It, it's we already saw like Cooper in the previews coming over, and I was so excited. I squealed like if anybody heard a very loud squeal from the Texas area of the country on Thursday night, that was me. Hmm. <laughs> I saw Cooper and I cheered. I think so. I heard it <laughs> all the way in the East Coast in the New York area. I think I heard it. <laughs> I was so excited, like, because I knew Liz was coming, and I mean, that makes sense. I mean, Liz and Tom, they're, they're connected, they're married, they have a child. You know, obviously, and Megan had said she was coming back for at least one more episode. <clears throat> but we so- never heard anything about anybody else, and, no. and Cooper was a perfect choice. I love Coop. Like, I, I guess I didn't realize how much I... I'd missed Harry Lennox. Yeah. Like, you, you, it's kind of that thing. You don't realize you miss someone until you see them again. You're like, I've yeah. missed you. And that's how I feel about Cooper right now. <laughs> yeah, it was it was awesome. Um, so I, I am very impressed to, I, I got to say that with Adrian Martinez about this, the ability that has made a character that could be made into a joke, into a flat, cartoonish He's made it a real person. They gave him a tiny bit of backstory with the brother, and he took it a run with it. And he has he has done this this very emotional scenes um, in, in all variety of, of ways. And and there, I mean, it's a great job. And and kudos. Yeah, it, he really has. The the whole cast has done a great job. Like, I oh, just yeah. that I went into it with really high expectations because I mean they're coming off the blacklist, and the blacklist is set set such high expectations for me and these guys have not disappointed at all i there i have seen one goof up in post-production i mean there may be more but i've only i'm I'm one of those people that i notice those things like that they jump out at me and it's like a big waving oh you mean you're talking about the guy with the mask off yeah i uh, thought that he had taking it off as he was falling unconscious i i don't think so i think it was a post-production error but in six episodes so far that are movie quality episodes put together in a short little amount of time, one post production error. That is mm. impressive. I mean yeah. that's kudos, guys. You guys have been fantastic with it. I just I can't get over it. And this is a lot of these people are either new or have been moded aren't usually doing this. So the fact that they got into the swing of it so fast Mm-hmm. That, that oh yeah, it's got, it's it's found the feed really fast. Yeah, you know it's eight episodes and, and they're they're awesome. Um, let's talk about Nez. Oh Nez, I you know I love Nez. I wasn't because they when they started promoting redemption, they really were focusing on Tom, Scotty, and Solomon because they're the three former blacklisters. And Nez really, I mean, she didn't end up on Red's blacklist. Lucky girl. Um, <laughs> mm. But. I, I was worried that she'd been kind of shoved to the side um, because mm-hmm. I, she just didn't get a whole lot of promotion. And I'm so glad that they've 
they've really dug into her character, and I love what they've done with her, and one of my favorite parts of this episode was the fact that she got clean with Howard. His death was one of the, death, quote-unquote, was one of the things that keyed her back into the drug abuse. As soon as she finds out he's alive, not knowing who Tom is, she goes to his son to help get clean again, to ask for, to be the support for that. And I, I love that little piece that, that Tom is the one that's going to be. It goes back to what Scotty said about Tom reminding her of Howard. Mm-hmm. I think I think Tom reminds Nez, at least subconsciously, of Howard. Yeah, but I think that's so, it's something that everybody is getting um, to because everybody seems, you know, rather attached to Tom even for a short period of time. So I think it's something that has to do with the fact that he reminds them of Howard. Well, that, that was one of the things that, um, I, I know we're trying to go into Nez, but I forgot to mention about Dumont. One of the things that I loved the most was how hurt he seemed to be and how how he pushed uh, Scotty for, well, why do you need this? You know, what's going on? Because I'm looking at who's on this this video here, and I need answers before I give you this. Like, it's mm-hmm. not that he wasn't going to give it. He just wanted to be pulled into the loop because his friend, you know, his teammate Mm -hmm. was supposedly against him and he didn't want to believe that. It just, the fact that Tom's been there, I think Bokenkamp said that redemption is supposed to, in, in the timeline, stretch about two months that Tom's there. And so, I mean, this has been a real time, basically. Yeah. This is less than two months, you know, Mm -hmm. in which Tom has been with this team and, you know, Nez had the reaction of she she made the comment to him at one point in the episode. She said, "You tried to ki- you're 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 the enemy. You tried to kill Solomon. You're new here. Why should I believe you?" You know, and but Dumont didn't have that with him. It was just there's got to be some mistake. And I loved mm. that about Dumont that he's so attached so quickly. Yeah, and, so and also so willing to und- to to understand the truth before he makes a, a call, yeah. which is which is you know very much. Um, uh, very he's much around like too. Yeah, he's also you know. an analyst. I mean, both of them yeah. are analysts. They they look at data. They they think in the analytical sort of terms versus relying on gut instinct in reaction. Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of these guys who are operatives have to do to survive. They have to have their instincts finely tuned because they don't have time to sit there and go, "Hang on, let me look at the evidence here." As you're, yeah. you, could you not shoot me for five seconds? I need to look at this evidence. <laughs> yeah, they they gotta they gotta rely on on um, on uh, on the on stomach feeling for things. Get, get reaction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, one of the interesting things they did with with um, Ness on this episode is when she is going to the dealer for her daily, uh, for her whatever, I don't know, maybe it's twice a day, I don't know, maybe it's once a week, I don't know, whatever it is, for her dose of, of uh, I think it must be cocaine or God knows what. And I would say so, because she, she thumbs at her nose. Yeah. It's, she's got a nervous habit, so is cocaine that sniffing, right? I think so. Yeah. Um, I'm sure <laughs> that how much drug abuse I've done in yeah, my life. <laughs> I'm not very, very conversant, but this, this, um, the first thing she does is says, did she send you? So I, I do wonder if she had had a habit of keeping a very close eye on her, of her team too, you know, because that's the first thing, the first thing she assumes is that Tom sent her. That, that Scotty sent Tom, you mean? Yeah, and yeah. that's what I meant. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's early. But, <laughs> Not enough coffee yet. <laughs> I, that's all the coffee I'm going to get for the day, but it oh. didn't do the job today. It's oh, it's for the rainy thing. That's when cup two comes into play. Um, <laughs> mug two. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I, yeah, no, that was very interesting. I mean, because in the pilot episode, Howard talked about, you know, about the, the satellites and the fact that they could watch mm-hmm. and this and that. And we, we've heard them talk about the the satellites the um mm-hmm. air air uh artex network and that yeah the artex Ar- network yeah. yeah and so they they referred to it not by name in in actual redemption but they've definitely referred to it in the fact that they use it and so you don't know there's always the possibility you've been seen going somewhere you know because mm-hmm. scotty used uh specific sweeps to try to find Solomon when he was when he went out of the plane Mm -hmm. and so I mean there's I feel like there's always this lingering possibility 
for this team that knows how much surveillance they have uh, have at their fingertips that they could be caught doing something they shouldn't be doing. And it, I think it also ties to the main show. Remember Drexel? Everybody's watching and they get mm-hmm. these rats that go into everything and can basically yeah. turn anything into uh, surveillance, which, by the way, didn't he just get on the news that they can hack going through all this? So it's it's interesting how some, you know, they keep saying it's separate, but I keep seeing the the things just being pulled in. You're shaking your head so, so bad. I think your head is going to fall off. It's going to. I never <laughs> believed Boken Camp when he said that. I'm sorry, John, but I don't believe you when you say they're separate. Nor Ryan, nor anybody else that said that it's separate. I sat there last night and I looked at the roomie. I said, you know, I guess someone could come in off the streets and watch this. They but could. they would have missed everything underlying about Rocha and Bud in the major. Yes. They would, of they those wouldn't get any of that. No. And that scene was, so, those scenes were so, so deep. But you never would have known. It, this would be a very shallow show for somebody that's just coming off the streets without the blacklist to back it up. And I, I think that what what is going to end up happening, because I think all these shows are being geared towards, towards uh, content watching, is just simply people are going to see Redemption. They're going to then go see the blacklist, and then they will get, when they get to Redemption again, they will be like, ah, now I get it. Yeah. So I, I think that, yes, they can function separate, but you can get, and that's what they, you know, if you really listen to what Bokkenkamp said, that's what he said. If you get the whole thing, you're going to get a lot more. But yeah, I mean, they're somewhat separate. Um, and Ness did, did that thing when, you know, he hawks uh, Tom. And it's funny because in that scene, she basically saved Tom's life without knowing that she was doing that. Oh, because yeah. Solomon would, would have got him? a clear line of shot if he had a, if she hadn't been hugging him. Yeah. I mean, and standing right there and talking to him and discussing it. Yeah. And she kept moving into the, the line of fire without realizing she was doing it. No, it's. I'm, I'm very happy that Ness did that. <laughs> would have cut the show off, and everybody would have been very sad. <laughs> and I, I, I think that the strength of and and the, this is the kind of thing that that both Blacklist and Redemption do very well. It's that you see the kind of person that other people are by the reaction of some other characters to them. So you you realize that Howard may appear crazy, and he obviously, when you see him with Scotty, you realize, boy, that relationship is uh, very much like Madeline Pratt in Red. I mean, it's contentious. You realize how much they they um, what I was going to say. Uh, how they Howard. they get Scotty? How how you see that Howard is a caring man and a good man by seeing the reaction Scotty has towards him, how he gets, you know, the, this kind of loyalty in which somebody who's an addict already back into the, the grip of addiction says, I'm, he needs help and I can't do that if I'm not, if I'm using, and he just, she just gives this to Tom. That requires an enormous strength and he shows both Ness characters as well as, as um, Howard. Howard's character. I, I agree 100% with that. It's I love the various loyalties in this show and the, the family loyalties and the you know the, the kind of adopted family loyalties. We have no idea what's what's going on with Nez's family if she has one anymore if she you know we, we really don't know. There have been small you know no out of the way yeah tidbits <clears throat> at best, but nothing nothing concrete to say about that. And so. It could be that basically Howard was the only person that ever believed in her, and that's that's powerful. And I just in one of the cuttings of the papers um, that I was able to read, it says that Howard was the biggest um, higher uh, employer of uh, veterans, of mm-hmm. former veterans, and how he helped them. So, and he seems like, you know, however, all the, the, the electronic surveillance and all that, Howard was one like Red, who believed that it doesn't matter how much technology you have, you always rely on your ground, on your person, on your personal intelligence, the human element of it. And that was very interesting. 
Well, if you look at Red, he builds extreme loyalties. He's been a little off his game since Kaplan, you know, with questioning and now Dembe and all of that. But for the most part, over the four seasons we've gotten to know Red, he he doesn't... When he trusts someone, he really trusts them. And he's usually pretty spot on about if he can mm-hmm. trust them or not. Um, there have been some exceptions for that, obviously. He's human, but... Overall, he's got a really good judge of character, and he instills a great deal of loyalty in people. That they would die for him if they need to. They would break the like law for him. Yeah. yeah. And and so I think Howard does that. I think there are a lot of similarities. And it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really funny. interesting to see Nez with that. Be- because you see similarities of Red with Howard and also of Red with Scotty. So they're very interesting, and I'm sure that once we get to see Katrina, we're going to see a very interesting, you know, family dynamics there, um, because they're, they, they're fascinating in that loyalty commanding aspect, uh, and the manipulating, which is, you know, when you're a, strat- a, strat- a strategizer, you're a manipulator. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, interesting, and I got other things, but let's go into into um, finish with Ness. Um, it, it was it, she had very very nice moments there with Howard in in the the conflict she had, and I can't wait to see she and Howard in the same room again. That's going to be nice. That's that's going to be a really special yes. moment, I think. Yeah, that's that's one to go go look forward to. How about Solomon? Oh, Matthias. <laughs> oh, I I think one of my favorite lines of the whole episode was at the beginning. He said, when he told Scotty that she and Howard certainly hadn't had enough couples counseling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that line was good. She um, was so pissed that entire, she was like, no, I need you to understand this. And he's like just popping off. <laughs> Yeah, he just says, hey, I'm on your dime. I'll, you know, if you say he's he's dead, uh, God rest his soul, but you, you didn't get enough couples counseling. And boy, was he right. I thought, uh, hey, maybe he should recommend the one Red Hat. <laughs> or, you know, hey, just do what the Keens did. A little bit of truth goes a long ways in a spy couple. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, um, it's interesting because Solomon doesn't seem to go for that level of 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 um distrust as as the ones have solomon is very much you know you save me and i'm i'm going to be loyal to you i wonder what happens when it it will be very interesting to see what happens when scotty tells him no uh, Tom is my son, and you know I think that eventually they're gonna see that both Howard and Scotty were playing. And when he when he received the direct command from from Scotty to uh, listen to Howard and 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 Tom, and I think it's gonna be a very very interesting scene. Yeah, I, I definitely think that they're being played. I've that's been like mm-hmm. that's kind of where my theory has shifted in the last couple weeks or so. Mm-hmm. Um. But they made a very purposeful decision, I think. Scotty did not tell Solomon why she was telling him to stand down. It was just, this is my order, do it. Mm -hmm. I thought there at the end she was going to, you know, when he was saying, no, this is how we deal with it. He's he's a mole in our company. This is how we handle it. I thought she was going to say, he's my son, don't. But she didn't. And I... I don't know if it's because she was just commanding his loyalty there. And, I mean, Solomon's not one to be swayed by emotional situations, particularly. And so maybe no. she, maybe he would have seen that as weakness and she knew it. I don't know. Um, because the previews for next week show Tom and Solomon going at it in the interrogation room. And, hey, I was right. It looks like Solomon's responsible for blooding up Tom's pretty face. <laughs> Yeah, well, he's been inching to do that ever since he shot him. Well, which is interesting because I, I mean, he he kind of had me fooled this season that that he had basically said let's let bygones be bygones and moved on that Solomon had, and that you know he was just moving on with his job and that you know he was fine with Tom as long as Tom didn't take another swipe at him. 
But I, I'm starting to think that he's just been biding his time until he could get a good shot in at him. I mean, he was, he wanted to pull that trigger. It was personal. I, I, you know, I don't disagree with you. There may be something there, even though he says, hey, you know, I get it. You know, I, I wreck his wedding, whatever. I, I also think that there is an element in, in Solomon that he was burned by betrayal. I mean, he had gone to the end of the world for the cabal and Lord Hitchens did the, gave the order to kill him. You know, with the same protocols that he had helped implement for them. And I think that betrayal, and this is, you know, it's funny because at the end we're going right back to wrestler and betrayal. And that betrayal and, and red and betrayal, so betrayal, loyalty are, are themes of all this. How he, he even though Scotty may be afraid of it, he's, the betrayal to him is something that he can't abide. Yeah. Well, I mean, in their line of work, none of them should. Um, I mean, that that's the way to get themselves killed. I, I don't blame him for that in the abstract. I mean, obviously, I don't want him to kill Tom. I'm rather fond of Tom. But, <laughs> but I mean, like, I, I could understand that. Like, when, when they worked together in season three of The Blacklist, he was like, okay, you know, yeah, I chased you down and tried to kill you and tried to kill your wife. And at the time they thought he had killed his wife, but Solomon's like, but we're working together now. It's just a job, you know? Mm -hmm. And the old Tom probably could have done, you know, done that perfectly fine. You know, I mean, and I think the only reason he's working with him now is because Liz is not actually dead, you know? Mm. Like, I think that's the only thing that in the end saved Solomon's life. Otherwise, he would have just taken the first option to put a bullet in his head working with Halsey on this time. Mm. But if Liz had actually been dead. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, I think that Solomon was willing to just put everything in the past, and then Tom shot him and proved that, eh, proved that he was not willing to put it in the past. And so I, I really noticed, do think he's been biding his time at this point. Yeah, I, I'm more inclined to see to think it is about the loyalty thing. But I also noticed something with Solomon. Um, Solomon didn't hurt uh, Howard as he was. Um, it's interesting that of all the people, uh, Scotty doesn't bring Solomon to to uh, get information from Howard. Also, he must have given instructions not to hurt you know like you said oh get for with your head and mm -hmm. all that you know so it's interesting to me that that scott is not willing to go solomon length on torturing howard uh oh, no. it, it, I, I don't think she had any intention to do permanent damage to howard and i think she was actually trying to avoid torturing him for a while <laughs> Just yeah, it's stubborn, you know it's spy love. Hard, brave men. <laughs> yeah, it's spy love. Um, but but very very interesting choices uh, made by Eddie Gafeki. You know how he plays Solomon. Um, and I notice that they're starting to do a bit more of those uh, very uh, intense um, close-ups that they do in the blacklist, and they are so interesting. I love those shots because you can really get into the soul of what the character is saying at that moment. Um, and and it was they had that one when he's shooting, and it was so interesting. Besides a very pretty face, but um, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it was it was a good good shot. It's not a Keen Minds episode until Tessa and I fangirl over Eddie Gathegi. Yeah. What can <laughs> we say? <laughs> He's pretty. Um, pretty is just pretty does. <laughs> um, should we go into into uh, Scotty and Howard or Tom first? Uh, let's do Scotty and Howard because they were, I, I, I put them down in the notes together because honestly, they just, and, and Tom works into it as well. I mean, because they're all so intertwined there. Mm. You just, we've had episodes in which that happens so much that Red and Liz, you can't really separate them. Tom and Liz, you can't really separate them. You know, mm -hmm. it, these people in a certain episode will be so intermixed. You just, like, as much as you want to, as, as much as my OCD wants to do one, two, three, four, they're, they're so intermixed you can't. It's mm -hmm. every, yeah, every okay. step is somehow <laughs> affecting something else. 
Yeah. I, I, I gotta say, I gotta, I'm, I'm having now a, a category of a romantic category that is, um, spy love. It's not quite romantic love. It's more intense. It seems to involve a, a level of, of distrust and, and, uh, and, and if, if it's not hand to hand combat, and I wouldn't be sure that when they were younger, they would have gone at it. Um, certainly we see if that is red, we see red and Katerina go at it in during the, the night of the fire. Uh, and, and now Scotty and Howard, you know, they're there. It's a fascinating thing. I'm not sure Scotty really came into her own as a spy of sorts until more recently, unless she's been undercover. I'm just, I'm thinking back to that video, um, where she was watching Kevin ride her, ride mm -hmm. his bike. And she's talking to the video for Howard and said, you know, I know you're off saving us from, you know, heaven knows mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. But here at the at the Jensen house, it's a big day too, and showing you know it just it sounded like she was very much apart from the yeah, you know apart from the company. Um, that when he when they got married, yes, she might have been involved in it, but her job was was Christopher, and that as you know probably as Kevin mm -hmm. grew up and as she got older and they <laughs> kept not finding Chris. She probably dug deeper and deeper into Halcyon just for something to do and take her mind off of it. I mean, because you have to imagine that since they didn't have any other children, you know, if all she had to do was sit at home and remember her child that's gone, that'd be horrible. I mean, yeah. I'd throw myself into work, too. I think that you just hit something very interesting right there without noticing. Her focus was on Christopher. And if she really was an undercover agent, maybe whoever took Christopher needed her to focus on the real thing. Maybe. I, I, I have a feeling, you know, Christopher disappearance is, is however Howard think it is all related. I think it's related to something else. But but Howard and Scotty, oh my God, that scene was so reminiscent of of uh, of Liz and Tom in the first um in in, a, in season one. Uh, season one and season two, yeah, I just the bold, <laughs> yeah, and and we can the get thumb. yeah we can get into that more with the parallels. I've got that down there with the parallels, but oh my gosh, it's those Hargrave men, <laughs> uh, <laughs> those Hargrave men and the and the women they love. <laughs> there, there is an interesting thing that happened with with Scotty that made me go crazy in 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 going back over every single scene that we have seen with her she she's at the apartment with eddie and says you know interesting apartment for a man who's dead or something of the sort she's very like what you know get this to the lawn tell him to find you know whatever it is mm -hmm. and she seems like you know it's just all business there and then she goes to howard and she's like thank god you're alive and all that and i'm like this is weird is she trying to make him believe that this was not her but then, you know, and then she they start talking about uh, Whitehall and she's, you know, back being like uh, her usual self. But then I remember all those scenes she has when she's like super, you know, sentimental and she's looking at a picture of Howard trying to find, a, you know, a good picture for the urology or whatever. And then, and then looking at... at at Christopher and and I'm not sure I think Scotty has that that's what she does she she has this incredibly vulnerable moment and then she snaps right out of it into bitchy mode or or spy mode or or controlling or manipulative mode she's gonna burn a lot of calories being a lying bitch <laughs> just that line <laughs> that's a new diet <laughs> oh you know maybe you should try that at least it might that way <laughs> It's a it's a very interesting uh, it, it, um, dynamic that they've created with her, and and she plays it brilliantly. And and you know there there it's been hard to tell because we haven't seen a lot of Howard as Howard. I mean, he's been so paranoid and so twitchy that we don't see a lot of Tom in him. But in that scene when he was being held, you saw a lot of Tom. Um, mm -hmm. just the, the, the shutdown, the snarking to cover up any sort of nervousness, the, 
absolute determination not to give on it. The way that, you know, a question's asked, torture's given, and then laughing at the torturer. Tom's done that multiple times where he's just, uh, the, the one that comes to mind immediately is when the Germans had him. Mm-hmm. And they're busy, you know, cutting on him and threatening him. He's gone, oh, that's a cute story, you know? <laughs> uh, he just, he makes light of people mm-hmm. threatening his life because it's it's a defense mechanism that he has. And it's interesting that even though he wasn't raised by Howard, he apparently got something, <laughs> something oh, yeah. on that. Yeah, I was saying before, when we were commenting before how they have created... I gotta tip my my fedora back to the writers even one more time. I don't know. I should just keep it off and just tip it continuously. <laughs> um, to the fact that they 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 created the character of Tom Keen first, and you know they obviously when they saw Ryan playing it, they they got it you know more rounded, more interesting. But now they've created the parents to fit the child that they created. And it's perfect because you can see in Tom, Scotty, and Howard. You totally see that. How he is definitely their son. Yeah, it's it's so much fun to watch. And I that was one of the things I was looking for when Redemption first started. I was watching for a little little twitches, little, you know, just mm-hmm. the body language. And I mean we we've seen little things. I mean not not just a lot, but that that's one of the things that stood out the most to me so far is the way that the way he reacted to the yeah. to the threats and the fact that it's just like a mirror image of his son and I love it. And so you you do think that Scotty was legitimately happy to see Howard alive and relieved to see him alive when she walked into that <laughs> hospital room. I think so. I think she goes, she has this. We have seen it. We have seen Scotty being, you know, talking about all this, you know, like the general, you know, I, there is a, only one way I'm going to get through this. And, you know, is with therapy, with, with antidepressants and with you telling me what I need to know. So I, I do think that there is an element that, you know, like everybody get their mechanisms to, to become strategically manipulate people and like red is knowing everything and being calm red is probably the calmest person i i don't only think red acting out of anger probably a couple of times in the show in the entire thing of the show and 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 scotty i think the power comes from the ability that she has of owning her weak things and being open about them and then turn around and in the same breath be thoroughly and completely uh, ruthless and in charge of herself. And I think that's is an amazing combination that they have put together. And I doubt that there would have been another actress as well suited to to perform that as as Famke. It really is like a, a switch flips and. I mean, it's interesting because we saw that with Tom undercover some in season one. Um, here we go again with, with mm-hmm. Tom and his parents. But I remember in season one, one of my favorite things, I, I had a set, a gift set that I was going to do for a while and then never ended up putting it together. But little little pieces of Jacob Phelps within Tom in season one when you could see mm-hmm. him through the, the persona that he wore. And one of them was when he in, I guess that was the second second episode when he woke up from his coma after being stabbed by Zamani yes you see that look that he got when he was just full-blown Jacob Phelps you know not wearing the mask at all you saw that look when he first woke up when he was coming out of the the medication and without even blinking halfway through to looking over at Liz the mask was right back on and Mm -hmm. he could just switch it like that it was so fast and without you know like, I still don't know how Ryan does that. It's it's impressive. Um, but, and, and while Scotty's isn't necessarily in her look, it is in her, she's able to make that switch very fast in her personality. Mm-hmm. And so does, it's, I think so does Howard. Yeah. Well, I mean, Howard's been just a nervous basket case, but he was super, super calm in that hospital. <laughs> 
I think because, and, and we may be dismissing this, but probably the first thing she did was put him on drugs. That's and true. I think that just because just because he might be bipolar, really, and they just made it much worse even by withholding or by giving him the wrong medication. Um, but definitely there was, I think that there was a different, it was a, a calmness about him that I didn't even see when Tom leaves and says step outside. And obviously what he did the second Tom left, instead of leaving, he spent the time just burning everything. Well, we talked about last week, why didn't he go to a different place, you know, and that's, that explains it. He had a, it wasn't like Tom's, um, Tom's safe house. house that he had in season one where he just had a few pictures and could toss it in a bucket and, and try to, try to get out. He mm-hmm. had an entire apartment full of evidence. I mean, you saw it. He had drawers full of it. He had boards mm-hmm. full of it. He had a Boxes. lot. Yeah, he just, he had a lot of stuff there. And. This probably 30 years since Tom's been missing. Yeah. That I mean, he's had, I bet yeah. that he got that apartment back then. And he started putting everything in it. Like, you know, the equivalent of Liz getting the, the storage unit yeah. or... Well, Solomon made the comment early in the episode, he goes, this is a nice apartment for a dead man. And so it might be that he's had this apartment for a while. It was just under an alias and he was keeping it away from Scotty because he was... Cert- you know, when he got it, it might have been, until I find something, I'm not going to put this on her. I'm not going to worry mm-hmm. her about this. I'm going to do this on the side. And when I find him, then I'll tell her. You mm-hmm. know, a good, loving husband. And then as the questions started coming up, he's like, I'm not telling her about this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I definitely, one of the other things that I noticed is um, that it was very, very intriguing. And he reminded me, you know, of Tom, but he also reminded me of Red. Uh, it's that expression he has, Howard, when he tells he tells her that, she puts a hit on Tom, and you see the little alarm that goes in his off. But he is so good. I mean, I get to tell you, Terry Quinn is unbelievable. He, it's just like a little flash, pluck, and you see the the uh, the thing. And then immediately she keeps talking about how she reminds him of Howard. You see again that little thing, like, okay, I got to now. I know how I'm gonna make you believe because he burned the DNA testing. He had a yeah. DNA test of Tom in the wall, and he burned it. So now he has nothing to show her that he is indeed her son. I mean, it's not like a DNA test couldn't easily be run. And I'm sure that's yeah. the first thing Scotty's going to do when he's, you know, when she puts him in cuffs is take a blood sample and send it off to her people and mm-hmm. put a rush on it. But I just, I loved that scene between them. It was, I've really been looking forward to these scenes between Scotty mm-hmm. and Howard. And I just, I loved that realization. First off, her coming in and she was just kind of, she thought she had it. You know, I've got your man and I'm about to put a bullet in his brain. (coughs) And you see Howard sit there and like you just said, it's just, it's this brief thing. And you can see it in his eyes. Like you're about to kill our kids. Stop. (laughs) And then, but then he has to get her to understand beyond anything and that's what he he waits you know he reminds me so much of red he waits until he has what it will take yeah it, he can't just bust out there with that i mean i was screaming at my tv i was like if you wait much longer howard it's gonna be too late oh my gosh you too <laughs> but the, the funny thing i found was when howard says how about this he's your son that in that second before and scotty says that's a lie and but you know that she she got it you know in that moment that she's just fighting against it but she realized it is true mm-hmm. well, it's like something when he's like oh my god i've had this in front of me and i haven't seen it um I think and obviously black- how tom how tom also talked to her about she told me that you know she feels so comfortable with me so obviously the Tom and Howard have shared a lot more conversations than the one we have seen. Oh, yeah. And I think it was Blacklister over on on Tumblr that she put up some really interesting uh, comments about the episode, uh, the night that it aired. And one of them that I found was very interesting, and I I actually am leaning towards now, is that Howard isn't necessarily sold that Scotty isn't Scotty. Maybe he still distrusts her and everything, but not he's not 100% sold that she's a 
body switch, you know, a pod person. <laughs> because mm-hmm. he keeps referring to Tom as her son, and then he said, he's our boy. You know, it was mm-hmm. the way he was reacting to it. I mean, he was bank. If he truly 100% thought she was a pod person, why would she care? That would give her more incentive mm-hmm. to shoot Tom in the she face. Should, yeah. You know, and, but he was banking on her loving him enough to, I mean, like you said, put put them aside for just a second and save the only decent person yeah. in their family. And, and, and I gotta say, those lines, our son is alive, so make the calls, Scotty. You and I can go on hating each other, lying to each other, and hurting each other after, but right now, at this moment, dear God, just get past our problems and save the only decent person in our family and i think that that applies to liz as well i think that that you know part of the reason because we see red now we don't see red 30 years ago and he has said many times i was a very different man then so i think that 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 both tom and liz are both the decent person in their families they're more decent than their parents were at the same age I mean, their parents have to be like beaten up in order to get slightly better. They are better already. Yeah. Well, I mean, Tom, Tom didn't exactly start the series out as a shiny example. But, I mean, av- learning to love Liz and then having his daughter, that was that was something so awesome with, mm-hmm. with uh, it was, uh, Carlos, I believe was his name. Yes. Um, and that you could see that, that... That it was, I mean, Tom could see this this other guy who had been raised almost identically to him, even to the point that the gun's shoved in his hand at 14 years old. I, You know, you caught that on there that, you know, Rocha t- took him in at a nine. nine years old and then put a gun in his hand at 14. Tom was taken in at 14, trained and put out, you know, into the into the field. Then there was rescue at 14. At four- Samar, yeah, it's age. Samar yes. was, uh, so the parents uh, killed at 14. So yeah. this is a, it's an interesting um, age, I guess. It's you know like when you're a man or something. Yeah, and it was just it was so interesting to see. I was going somewhere with that. I've just totally lost it. The train went uh, off track. <laughs> um, it was interesting to see. Um. <laughs> oh my right. god. There it goes. It happens. It happens yeah. a lot with me. <laughs> but regardless, you know. Oh, what was the, that? The, 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 also, an interesting thing was 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 Scotty, you know, falling into this realization that Tom is indeed her son. He's like, you said it yourself, and, and she's like. You know, and and then she she hesitates. It's like the first thing he has is like, "Did you do it?" I mean, not say, "Don't do it, don't don't kill him." And and yes, she keeps the fact that it's her son because I think that she needs to know that for herself. But yeah, I think but that she knows it enough. Could you imagine until... if Solomon had already taken that shot? Yeah. I mean, or or if he had shot him while on the phone with her. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh! I mean, just. That Fomka's amazing with that scene with her just sliding down yes. the wall there. I mean, there is no way Tom is not her son. I 500% believe that. She was so relieved to know he was still alive. You know, that yeah. she had not. I mean, she she came really close to killing her own son. It was on her order. And. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see next week if she's the one that gives the order for Solomon to to rough Tom up. Yeah, or Solomon it, it, takes it, that on it's himself. It's all very, very interesting things. But the, the, the oh, I mean that that scene with that scene was unbelievable with her. Um, it's just uh, that you know when when she starts realizing that and, and 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 howard you know is just like it's they know each other so well they really do they play each other like you know you you can tell and i think that they both actually loved each other but somebody somebody did this to them i don't think because i am I, I, I know blacklister had the lines and she said oh no scott is beyond behind uh white hole no she, it's not she uh, Blacklisters puts an a, a, a little or A before that 
phrase. And as Scotty says, everything could be. Everything that could be. So Scotty doesn't know what Whitehall is, but Scotty knows it's a dangerous well, thing. It, it could even be that once she... Because, I mean, she talked... When she was telling Trevor about it, she said that she came across it and that she approached Howard on it, and that's when he started blaming her, and that's when she went to the board. So there have been multiple months. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, she made the comment that the last several months of, her, of his life... Nobody knew who were. So this has been months. This has been, what, maybe six months or more since this happened. She has had both the time and the resources to search out Whitehall. She may know now more about what Whitehall is. Maybe not who's behind it because she thinks she's going at it with the assumption that Howard's behind it. Yes. And whoever did set it up, I bet they did their their due diligence on making it look like Howard did it. Well, the, I think that they, they whoever did was very clever because you get a mm -hmm. couple, most couples... You know, he, statistically, most couples who lose a child, forget about getting a child taking that you never find ever again. Yeah. They end up divorcing, separating, uh, being thoroughly miserable. And somebody played that that was already happening and created a rift between them. And it was masterfully done. Um, because that, that created a vacuum of power and somebody obviously took it. I think, I don't think that is either of them. I think they're, and I think that those, those, those arguments in the boardroom are going to be actually a play. Cause I think that by that time where we get to the end, I think that's going to be them working together, but keeping the appearances that they're against each other in order to draw out the real culprit. Well, like Liz and Red did against Kirk. I mean, yes. yeah, she was pissed at him, but... In the end, she needed to get to Kirk because Kirk had Agnes. And so she and Red played the part of being really angry at each other and, you know, just not not wanting to have anything to do with each other so that Kirk would believe it when, when Liz called him and said, I want to help you. And, I mean, I, I could definitely see that between Howard and Scotty. Like, okay, yes, I'm still angry at you, but there's obviously a bigger... A bigger baddie amongst us. Let's let's work together and get him. Yeah, I um, the, I gotta say something. The music is perfect again. Always. I mean that that it's... song was like, oh my god, is so perfect. Oh. You know how low are you willing to go before you reach all your selfish goals? Punchline after punchline, leaving a sore. It's just. Perfect, um, absolutely perfect um, song for that for that scene. Um, so one of my, you know, as as loudly as I squealed over the fact that Harold Cooper is going to be in next week's episode, which I am absurdly happy about, I also had a moment very similar to that when Tom called Howard Dad. Oh yeah, I think I heard that one too. Because that's probably, if you think about it, looking back, and I really hope that the next couple weeks, because Howard said something to Scotty about telling her everything about mm -hmm. where Tom had How been, important. you know, everything he knows about it. And so I'm really hoping we're going to get more on uh, Frank and Ava Phelps next week, you know, more information on that. Even if we don't meet them, at least get information on that. But regardless, I mean, considering what the Major said when he picked Tom up, and uh, saying, you know, about his situation in the foster system, the fact that Tom never felt loved before Liz, all of that wrapped in says that the, the family life with the Phelpses was not, not very good. So my guess is Frank was Frank and never dad. You know, um, I, I have a feeling, and I may be wrong on this, but my, my gut feeling on it is that Tom has not called anybody dad in his memory. Yeah, I mean, because he obviously didn't call Bud dad. I mean, regardless of being raised by him. He was, I mean, he called, now him he, called, he called him Bud when everybody else either called him McCready or the Major or even Bill. Bill. But, I mean, Tom was the only one that called him, as far as we've seen, called him Bud. But. Yes. It was a beautiful episode because we never got anything about how Tom felt about the whole thing. And yet, I mean, Ryan, without saying a simple, the only thing he says, I was raised the same. And. The, in, but the way that that scene played, those two actors just brought it home. Like, there you know, you could so, see so much depth there. And I feel so bad. If, okay, any of our listeners that have not watched The Blacklist, 
go do it now. Like, do not, <laughs> do not stop, <laughs> you know, do not wait. Go watch The Blacklist because you will understand the depth of that scene. Because, I mean, if you think about it, he's, you know, Liz pops up in the morning and says, I want to get married today, you know, and Tom's like, okay. <laughs> um, situates it, spends the entire morning getting their wedding set up, you know, they're, they're, working to get the wedding set up at, at the uh, at the church they'd wanted to get married at, turns around, goes home, is picking up his tux from home, gets bombarded by Bud and Gina in his home on his wedding day, is put down to be executed in his living room. On his knees. On Yeah, that's what I said, you know, put down to be executed. Mm -hmm. Gina shoots Bud. Tom has to bury Bud, who raised him, who is the closest thing at that point he's ever had to a father goes to the church, has to confess this to, to Liz because he doesn't want to go into their marriage with this hanging over them without, you know, giving her the out she deserves. So he's looking at potentially losing the love of his life and their child if she walks away. Goes into their wedding. They're standing there about to say their vows when Red walks in with a shotgun and their wedding is ambushed by Mr. Solomon. And Liz is injured, nearly loses Agnes. Liz fakes her death. All in one day. He has had, and then he becomes essentially a single father for the next month of his life. Insert, you know, Kirk fiasco after. Tom has had no time to really sit back and digest what's happened with Bud and how he feels about that. And by this point, it's so far past that you could see that kind of working through him. Mm -hmm. As Carlos was talking about it, you know, you could see that that understanding there when Carlos says, I know he deserves it, but the man raised me. And um, Tom's probably just the there reason going, why he, yeah, probably the reason why Tom didn't go first after the mayor. You know, he tries to to see if he leaves him alone. Uh, and, you know, he goes to Gina and says, help me get out. But he never goes to the major. He never because he knows what is going to happen. I mean. Major Ray made, made it clear that he had no value for him except with a bullet in his head. Exactly. Now, did you notice that little thing when he's talking about you men? He said you men more than money to him. He's holding his belly like that really hurts him. You know, that, that not even. And I think it is, you know, he's starting now to be able to recognize this because he had found Howard. And he just called Howard dad. So now he can begin that that vulnerability that he would not been able to do that without crumbling and he's he's also become a father himself i think mm -hmm. that that has done wonders for him understanding what a dad should be i don't think he had a, a clear understanding i mean to him a dad mm -hmm. is like bud you know regardless that's what a dad is you know and i think that's one reason that he reacted like he did to kirk it's because you know, if you're not useful to the father, the father puts a bullet in your brain. That's that's what a dad is, right? And then he became mm -hmm. he became a father to Agnes and he learned how to be a dad to Agnes and and then meeting Howard, all of that kind of wrapped up together. Yes, I think he's he's come to more of an understanding now of that's not what a dad should be. That was an unhealthy relationship. But when that's all you know, Mm -hmm. You know, you don't know that you don't know it. I mean, it's, in, you know, we have no idea what Frank was like, except for what we can guess, you know, and then we do know what Bud was like, and he was a bastard and a half. And, I mean, that's, but now he's starting to see that there are people, even in the warped relationship that, that, you know, that Carlos and, um, and Rosha had, Mm -hmm. there was still a form of love there. He was still his son, you know, and he, Rosha did for for Carlos what Bud couldn't or wouldn't do for Tom. And mm -hmm. I lean more towards wouldn't. He could have. Yeah. You know, yeah, but he, I mean, he could he, have he, loved him. He, he got a little bit of that with Gina that decided to help Tom instead of, of the major. Probably also out of a healthy sense of self-preservation because eventually it, it was going to be her uh, in the in place of Tom. Oh, yeah. I, I think that she saw... You know, I mean, because Tom was the golden boy. I mean, Jacob mm -hmm. Phelps was the Major's best operative. Mm -hmm. The Major handed him over as the best operative when Red asked for the best. So we know that he was the top of the top in, in mm -hmm. St. Regis. 
It's come from several different directions. And so, yeah, I think that Gina saw the fact that that Bud put that much effort into taking him down and was willing to put a bolt in his head twice and went, mm, you know, let's handle this before this is me kneeling on the ground, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because sooner or later, I'm going to do something he doesn't like, and he doesn't like me half as much as he likes him. <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. I'm only useful as, as long as I'm, I'm willing to do whatever, um, regardless of my own loyalties. Yeah. Um, and, and that scene, can we talk about the scene when he actually springs Howard out and, and, and Howard is like, no, 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 you gotta keep on the mission. And I kept thinking, boy, what is about this spice? The most, I mean, it's like, like Red with Liz. It talks about how much I love you and now be a darling and go get the stew maker or whooshing or the plague or... I mean, it's also the danger to Tom. I mean, it kind of reminds me of when when Liz broke into um, in um, oh uh, Earl, Earl the Earl uh, King yeah Earl King. Thank you. When he when she broke in when when uh, Red's in that cage and she breaks him out and he goes, you know, no, don't do that. And she's like, you know, I care about you. This is why I did that. I, I really felt that with, with Tom breaking in, because I've come to the conclusion now, I finally settled on my conclusion, that Howard is Howard, he is not, he's not a fake Howard, I was a little worried about that for a while, mm-hmm. and that the reason he's reacted to Tom like he has with, I mean, he's never called him son to his face, he, he finally asked about Agnes, but it took him a while. I think he is just so laser focused on getting this dealt with. He's like, I will rebuild the relationship that I want with my son once, once this is dealt with. But he doesn't have the emotional capacity right now to open those floodgates and approach it with any sort of objectivity. Well, and so imagine if you think if you think that your the world can actually they can, everybody can get killed, including them. It's like. The same thing with 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 Red, you know, and Liz is like, you know, can you can you crash into somebody's life just a little more gradually, like Zoe, like you know, getting to know her first. You gotta just, but then, is a man who was going to release a biological weapon that would have basically killed most of the people in in DC, and it comes to. You know, you got to save the world and yourself before we can even think about, hey, you know what? Hi, I'm your dad. Yeah. It's, there are things that are, I don't want to say more important, but they're bigger than just urgent. them. They're urgent. Yeah. They're urgent and they're, and they're huge. And, but if we look at Tom, we've seen over and over again how when he gets emotionally involved in something... Sometimes he doesn't make the best decisions, and so that could be why Howard's put the brakes on on the emotional relationship. And I think it was so sweet when he called him dad, and he goes, "Dad, you haven't called me that." And that's when you see him getting up. He's following him then, and then he's just go, go, go. You know, it's it's a nice, uh, you know, opposing parallel with Bud, where Bud expected absolute loyalty no matter what, and you know, he better. Even at his own detriment, Tom better choose Bud over it. And and Howard keeps going, no, you need to be safe. You need to go do this. You know, leave me here. I'm fine. Yeah. Um, it, it's also interesting how, to me, maybe Howard wasn't trying, not, was not calling him son on purpose. Because... You know, it's like it, remember that 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 uh, scene when Scotty thought that she was meeting the Phelps, and she's like, you know, um, J- uh, Jacob. I I know his name is Jacob. It's like I don't want to take your son away from you because you rear him and he's your son. I think that if somebody, if if you just met a perfect stranger and told you like, hey, my son, come over here, Christopher, it will be like Liz with with Rostov, like. My name is Liz, and no, you're not my father. So yeah, it's a respect thing. Yeah, it's like I, you know, you're an adult, and and I spent my entire life beside you. So what Rostov did was, you know, alienating Liz more because it didn't have that element of, you know, what, I, I'm I'm your father, or, but I don't know you. I wasn't, you don't know me, so why should I go and hug you? Why should I go and call you son or daughter when you have no idea? You don't know me from Adam. Yeah. 
I, I agree, and I, I do love that. And that was that was one of my earlier theories that kind of got shoved aside, and then, yeah, I, I agree. I'm kind of back to that, that mm. that does make sense. And especially when you when you put it against what happened with Rostov and, and with Liz. I yeah. hadn't thought I about mean, it in that, that fashion, and I, yes, that makes perfect sense. You know, when, when he says, you can't let me drown, I'm your father. And Liz says, watch me. <laughs> I can love Liz. <laughs> what? I mean, you're just this dude who tried to kill me, tried to get me kidnapped and kill me, and, and now you tell me. And the same thing goes with, because Liz has to have a kill certain her husband. thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that certainly elicits a, a, a certain love, right? Um, <laughs> Let me murder everyone you love so that I'm the only thing you have left. Then you have to love me. No, then you're the villain. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what Jesus. I don't know what terrible thing happened in your past that made you this this twisted thing you are. And what happened was he had a son, very much like Scotty and and Howard. He, she he thought he had a, a daughter, and the daughter disappeared, and never saw her again. And it twisted him inside. So this is the same thing that have happened to Scotty and Howard. And they were not. Rostov says he's a businessman. These guys are spies, so when they get twisted inside, it's just awful. I mean, they yeah. they get a level of of distrust and manipulative behavior that most of the honest businessmen who got somehow trapped in the whole thing had no idea. So you could see how seriously messed up even Red is by having to make choices or having your child taken from you or having to give up your child to keep them safe. Yeah. So one of the parallels that I have written down here that I oh, I got the biggest kick out there. of. I got it's the biggest parallel ki- time. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, we've already touched on the whole Roshan mm-hmm. Bud and Tom and Carlos thing, so I figured it was it was cool to go ahead and go into this one specifically because mm-hmm. we're talking about the Hargraves in general. Yeah. But it's those Hargrave men. I swear. Um, you've got. I, I love that line because I was like, where is he going with this when he starts calling her skinny? I'm yeah. like, okay, Howard. Because <laughs> it takes a lot yeah, of Eat energy. a piece of cheese? Yeah, <laughs> Some cars? Yeah, yeah it, it it burns a lot of calories being a lying bitch. <laughs> but immediately my brain went back to season two of The Blacklist when Tom's waking up in the boat and Liz is sitting there and pummeling him with questions. He goes, bitch. And I remember that he came under a lot of flack uh, in the fandom at that point. And I'm going, you know, <laughs> yeah, but come on. The guy just got gut shot, imp- you know, improvised surgery and wakes up on a filthy, disgusting boat, probably in a whole lot of pain and <laughs> sick and everything. You know, if that's the worst he calls her, I think we're on a good day. But I just I got such a kick out of the fact apparently this is the Hargrave men and how they react to their wives torturing them because they've lied. Or at least the, the wives believe they've lied. In Tom's yeah. case, it, yes, definitely. It lied. was exactly well, the Howard's same too. thing that, that Tom did. <laughs> when he, Liz breaks his thumb. You know, it's like uh, you go for anger because anger you can you can deal with. Yep. You know, and, and, and I think that there was a bit of I don't know that that Howard gets that all of that is actually real, or maybe he's used to Scotty going like this, and you know he cannot deal with Scotty crying, but he can certainly deal with hangry Scotty. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I don't want to say you know guys like it's only guys, but I, I'm sure there are women that are this way too. But you know, it's like men are like, no, no, don't cry. I can't deal with you crying. Like, just tell me what to do to make you stop crying, sort of thing. <laughs> And so I, I feel like that that would be. You could imagine that Scotty would be able to turn the waterworks on if she needed to, you know. <laughs> well, it's it's a very interesting situation because it's exactly the same. This is the first time that they both both come face to face after both are recognizing that they're in different sides and regarding the other one as an enemy. Mm-hmm. So this is this is just awesome. I mean, but there were. I just I hope that the Hargraves come out of it. As well as the Keens did. That's all I have to say. We we need to sit down in which Liz and Liz goes, Okay, this is how we fixed it. This is what you guys need to do. Liz <laughs> needs to be their couples counselor. <laughs> so I would not recommend putting him on a boat shooting him and putting him on a boat. <laughs> well, it worked for her. I mean it evened the score. 
I mean, she, all I'm, saying, I, I'm saying that she would tell Scotty, I do not recommend this for you guys. <laughs> Tom's just shrugging, going, Meh. Whatever we works, it. babe. It's fine. <laughs> We're all alive. It, it's fine. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that, that you would just put your finger on, 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 on the real issue for them. Just being alive is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Survived it all. A little torture, this and there. They're spies. This is what these, I mean, has anybody ever watched Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Come on. That's, you know, this is what these people do. Yeah, we throw bookcases on top of one another. I mean, we've seen the recall in in Luther Braxton and whoever, I mean, whether that was Red or somebody else, they were going on it pretty good. Yeah, it's like, this is what spies do. This is not abnormal for the genre. It's it's not a, it, it's spy on spy, not domestic abuse. And, and, and if I may, may intersect a little bit of my crazy theories, I just want to call attention to a slight, tiny little scene that happened on the blacklist. When Red comes to see Carla that he had just got her back, she punches him on the mouth. That was not a slap. It was a punch on the mouth. And Red had this red welt on his mouth afterwards. Oh, there and was he's blood. Like, I actually just watched the scene the other day. Like, she drew blood. She split yeah. his lip. Yeah. And it, it's like, okay, uh, woman. <laughs> and he just looks at her like, Oh God, here we go again. You know, so <laughs> do you feel better? Did that make yeah. you feel better? All right, <laughs> moving forward. <laughs> and then going to 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 Dom and saying, you know, she had your temper, and and you know, at least that's the same thing. She meets Red, and you know, hi, there you are. Let me just stab you on the neck. Let me punch Rostov. So it's like, yeah, I mean, this these are not these are these are different things from every everybody or somebody just getting a punch but you know a woman getting a a, a man with a with a a, a a a pen because hey he asked for a cold one in a in a tone she didn't like this is it's this a, is spice it's a heightened reality megan called it one time and that's accurate it's heightened reality and you've got to treat it you've got to go into it that way you can't go into it thinking these are your next door neighbors they're not if they are you might want to move um <laughs> you know as fun as it would be you know <laughs> I do have another parallel. Yes. I don't, know was... if, I don't know if you noticed, when Russia knew about the, the snipers, parallel to Howard having an in in there, because he was not just Tom. Um, and it's obvious that Tom, that Howard has somebody else in, because when she tests your associate, Howard doesn't betray the slightest amount of distress. It's only when it says him, I I got a hit on him. I already called a hit on him. That's when he gets worried. So that leads me to believe that that cat is Scotty's person. Yeah. So and then that was a nice parallel to Rosh to Rosha or Rosha. Um, supposed to be the boss running the operation, but in reality was the insurance agent. So. This is the 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 Hargraves thinking that the other one is running the operation, but in reality is going to turn be turn to be I think somebody within their operation. I like I said I, I wrote a, a bit up maybe about a week ago in which I, I posted on Tumblr, said that I think my, my current <laughs> theory as it stands is that someone has set all of this up that someone probably on the board or on their legal team. Um, most likely on the board because they would be in the the best position to take over went in took christopher um it may be that either they or whoever they were working with got cold feet they were supposed to kill him and like you know you've got this four-year-old little kid looking up at you and you're going i can't kill him and so they ended up tossing him into the foster system and you know he's just going to go away um and and then that would make sense for why um why Game's mother got paid. Why Lucy Game was paid. You know, you have someone, whoever's orchestrating this. But that creates the rift between the Hargraves. Start pushing Howard to be crazy. And then when Scotty comes to them and says, he's he's lost his mind. He should not be in charge right now. She went to the board. That's what, what keys me off. Mm-hmm. That's someone on the board. Mm-hmm. And so they're gradually putting this rift in there. And then you mm-hmm. had Kat early on make a comment to Scotty when they went in after Kevin Jensen. They said, 
everybody's watching you on this. You're new to mm-hmm. this. You're newly, you know, at the actual head of the company. People are watching you on this. And so I think that they are – whoever's orchestrating this has been making moves to – invalidate both Scotty and Howard mm-hmm. as whether they get killed or whether they, you know, are just get not valid down. options. Yeah. Yep. And so they can step up and take control of this company. And I think we're going to see that come to head in the finale. Yeah. I have a, a my, my theory is almost exactly the same, except I think that Christopher's disappearance has nothing to do with this. It was just somebody taking an opportunity, seeing a vacuum of power created by the disappearance of Christopher, in which probably neither one of the Hargraves were really looking at what was going on in their company. And that's very possible. I just, I I like links and stuff like that, so I'm one of those people. So I I like the idea, but I could definitely see it, as you just said, you know, someone taking advantage of that as well. So I could see it going either way. But regardless, I do think that there's a third party in there that is Mm. working all of this a very intelligent very powerful third party that wants a whole lot more power because yeah that halcyon's huge i mean they've got a a satellite network they have contracts with the government i mean it's massive if you could control it yeah it's what was it scotty said we are the definition of too big to fail yeah i i think also the, the fact that it was the insurance executive, not the insurance company, that was in there is almost because we're seeing a very good parallel in this case in what's happening with them. So it's not somebody that is the owner of the company. It's somebody within the company that found a nice little way of creating themselves a, a, a little niche. Mm-hmm. They're using the company resources and creating this thing. And now, now that they're big enough, they want to just take over and, and push the hard graves up. Exactly. Uh, it's it's perfect i mean it's diabolical but it's perfect <laughs> and so yeah, yeah i think we'll see that and i i love your theory that you said after the uh, the photos came out yesterday um for for the eighth episode i agree with you that i think that that the ha- that howard and scotty are playing whoever this is that they yeah. finally tipped off we're not each other's enemies we may have a whole lot of problems but we are not actually each other's enemies in in playing whoever <laughs> It was it was very interesting that in that conversation, I mean, Howard and Scotty was very, very enlightening because it was a whole different dynamic there. But one of the things that caught my attention was that even in after after Scotty uh, torture him and boy, that was that was pretty rough. Um, she still calls it. We have the only decent thing in our family. So we I mean, you may torture me. I may lie you. I may set you up. I may send our son to spy on you. But we're still a family, you know, yeah. dysfunctional. Like Tom said, you know, we occasionally try to kill one another. Yep. And I think that 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 is what we're gonna see. Can I mention now one thing? Cat was wearing a plaid dress. The the one that she was wearing. Yeah, and it's the same one that she was wearing when Scotty approached her about Howard being off his meds. I did exactly. notice that they replicated that. I was like, because that's rare in it, especially in a show this this short. I mean, we've joked over on Tumblr about, well, of course, people, you know, wear the same clothes. It'd be nice if you had, you know, never wore the same clothes twice. But, you know, hey, you've got an... <laughs> you but in to... the blacklist, they do. I mean, I, I've noticed the same ties for Red, the same ties for Cooper, the same... Yeah, they yeah, do they, have... They do, a... right, which, which is great, because that makes it much more realistic. But in eight episodes, to I feel like that's the fact that they replicated that dress. Yeah, Scotty has worn the something. same dress twice. Yeah, that probably means something there. And so. Yeah. Uh, and did you notice who else was wearing a nice plaid suit? The FBI woman, Helen Abernathy. Oh, was she? I guess she was. Yes! She uh, was wearing a nice plaid suit, and there you are. I mean. Carlos uh, Cantara was not in jail. Yep. That, and, and that plat thing said, I noticed that Scotty has never worn anything plat. And, uh, you know, going back to the blacklist, I remember at the time when, when Alexander Kirk, uh, Constantine Rostov was, was coming out and we were seeing 
all this deception levels. I noticed one thing that nobody in his organization, in his houses, anywhere there was blood in it. So it kind of got me thinking, you know, he may be misguided. He may certainly have been gone evil by all the money and the desperation and the fear and the pain of losing his wife and daughter. But I think that he honestly was, did not, did not know about the fire and it was, I mean, he was who he was. That's yeah. basically what I'm trying to say. So I think that there is something. Up. I don't think that Scotty Hargrave is a hundred percent clean squeaky. No, no, she's not squeaky. No, uh, I think that she is an undercover that became like his her son. Stay with a name, but I do think that her objective was not to hurt Howard. It was to protect Howard. And to be there making sure, especially if you're handling uh, contracts to somebody who has a mental illness, you will be very careful to put maybe somebody there that you can trust to keep an yeah. eye on them. Yeah. Well, I think that about wraps this up. Is that, do you have anything else? No, I don't. I'm looking forward to next uh, week's episode. We're getting Cooper. Uh, Howard gets rescued by Cooper. And uh, we see or, Tom. Or at and... least Coop. And, and I love that because, okay, this is something that back when in season, I guess that was 3A, when when uh, Cooper and Tom were working together, the, the ongoing joke uh, mm. with me and a couple other people on Tumblr was, Cooper, we know it's really late. Adopt Tom. He needs a good father figure. Cooper, mm. adopt Tom. You know, and he kind of did. I mean, he was the officiant at their wedding. Yeah. He spoke. I mean, Liz sees him as a father figure. I think he just kind of took tom in once he figured mm -hmm. out you know yes he's an operative yeah he bends the the binding more than i'm willing to but i think he kind of became fond of tom <laughs> through through that whole experience and so i love that when liz i you assume that liz is saying you know um what can i do to help on the phone i do mm -hmm. hope she'll be there uh at some point because from what megan said in her interview it sounds like she gets a scene with tom you know, mm -hmm. that she and Ryan did a scene, not just on the phone together, but physically mm -hmm. in the same, you know, spot. And so I, I'm hoping, but it also, maybe, because Ryan did an interview a um, week or two ago, said something about Agnes's first birthday party. So it may be that, that um, Liz is in both seven and eight, and that we get the mm -hmm. birthday party at the end, um, which would be nice. But um, regardless. Um, Cooper. Cooper, thank you. I'm like, I keep going off and spacing off today. Um, but it's, I, I love the fact that it's Cooper coming in. And it's also going to help because I've been wondering how, is, Liz doesn't share, especially, like, she she's careful about her own secrets, but she doesn't share other people's secrets at all. Like, if it's not hers, she doesn't tell. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just, she's really good about that. And I could see... You know, I was kind of wondering how the task force was going to find out that Tom has been working with Halcyon. Because if he continues working with Halcyon after all of this is done, they're probably going to cross paths again at some point. Mm -hmm. And honestly, to be fair, Liz is an FBI agent. Probably needs to know, because there's going to be someone, Panna Baker's going to come into it. Someone that knows Liz is an FBI agent is going to run across Tom and be like, Keen? Yeah, and they're I... going to put two and two together. And so ha Harold needs to know that Tom is working with Halcyon. Just from a legal standpoint, to cover their butts, he needs to know as the head of the task force. Well, and so you, I'm really you're glad assuming that he doesn't know already. Because well, yeah. remember one thing, Harold Cooper has a very high level clearance yeah. within the FBI. And... Uh, Tom was already working with, for the CIA as a, as an operative. No, you you say that, but there no, was but no... he was he has been hired by the CIA to do um, to conduct missions. Yeah, the, he has the worked Rabat with one. the CIA. Yeah, it's... but not 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 being an agent, being an operative, which is different. Not being well, an agent I, I think, of... I don't think that they're called agents. I think they're actually called operatives in the CIA, but regardless. Well, um... Not not as a, as a car-carrying member of the CIA, but as oh, a God. independent contractor hired by the CIA to go after certain things. And again, 
Tom is met by the CIA guy. You don't think that before meeting anybody, they have done a thorough background check. And then there is a slight little matter that Tom Queen, Tom Keen, is like the Teflon identity. Uh, Ames murdered. No matter. You can teach a school. Uh, Jolene Parker, a suspect. Oh, it's okay, honey. You're squeaky. Mira Malik, undercover CIA operative her entire career, an expert interrogator, and she didn't spot one little tiny thing that was out of place in there. I don't know. To me, it sounds like uh, it's been professional in this crop continuously. It must be have like one of those uh, robo, um, what is it called, Roomba? Like, <laughs> you know, Tom has his own personal uh, identity Roomba. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> no, I, you and I have different opinions on who was doing that cleaning. I've always been under the opinion that, that Bud has contacts all over the place, even if they're in the CIA. Sure. But, but even the, after Tom, after the major is dead, he keeps getting that squeaky gleam. Yeah. But I mean, there's the cabal did it with Ames and then I'm trying to think, I mean, he really doesn't. Well, yeah, he he was applying for a school there in D.C., but there hasn't been anything connected to him, you know, on a negative on his uh, on his. Jolene Parker murder. That was ages ago. That's been it's what? been scrubbed since then. I'm saying yeah. I'm saying since it last got scrubbed, yeah, with the whole cabal incident, it is not. He's he has not. Um, no, no, no. The um, the heist. But that was swept under the rug. Bread yeah. made sure it was swept under the rug. So, you know, well, I mean. Maybe it wasn't even Red. Maybe Red just ate the sin, but it was really Howard who did it and Red just cover up for him. Ooh, that would be interesting. Because we have no idea. I mean, obviously, Red finds out at one, mo at one moment, but we don't. Just because Howard knew doesn't mean that Red knew when Howard knew. I mean, Red may have found it on his own and then went to Howard and Howard said, yeah, I know. And said, well, by the way, your kid is in trouble. So we don't really know who was there or, or, or how Red is involved with all this thing, which I think it's at the end we're going to see something there. Um, but it's definitely, uh, it, it's, it's, it's very interesting. This, this identity scrubbing and, 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 and Roomba identity Roomba <laughs> that because it's Teflon, nothing sticks to him. If anybody draws, I want a fan art of this now. Tom Keen's <laughs> identity Roomba. <laughs> somebody do the thing, please. Somebody do the thing. <laughs> yeah, I it's, love it's... it. <laughs> It's, it's, it's remarkable because we have seen also a couple of other operatives who have had their Roomba gone. You know, they got their... Samar has a Roomba. I mean, she had a whole identity created by, by the Mossad. So whenever she went in the system, this other identity appeared. Um, we also have another one which is escaping me at this moment. Um... Somebody else got a Roomba going. A lot of them have Roombas going. <laughs> it's, it's it's like a whole scrubbing thing. Oh, Emma, Emma yeah. got her professionally scrubbed. So there is there is something going on with that that is just uh, interesting. What's what's happening? Yeah, it's also part of just being on a spy show. I mean, you know, that's they. But but my point I mean, was. Cooper may have got some sort of, of even if it was a discreet thing, saying uh, Tom Keen is a good guy. And I, it, it always goes back to me to, and I know people have some wild theories, and I myself have had some pretty extreme theories about that. When, when uh, Tom says in season um, one, I'm one of the good guys. Yeah. And it's funny because it's repeated like almost within the next scene by Ressa saying we're the good guys. And uh, and you have Nez. You have Nez a couple of episodes ago. She said, I wish we we're had the time good to explain guys. this, but we're the good guys. Yeah. So there is something in that whole thing that tells me there is a bit more to Tom that we know. And there is a bit more of that good guys that we know. So Cooper may have just got a little so, some, something saying he's one, he's a good guy. And that accounts for the way that he warmed up to to Tom beyond just being 
you know, Liz's husband and, and he's being a good father and he's he works he very well. Have. He's a very talented. Yeah, I, I personally, where I come from, I, I think that he saw his loyalty to Liz and that's what mm-hmm. what endeared Tom to him. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, he's got a lot of flaws, but his loyalty is 110% with Elizabeth Keene. You know, he may do some stuff that's super sketchy because of that loyalty, but in the end, his heart's going to be in the right place. And I think for Cooper, that means a lot, you know, because he's been willing to bend some rules because his, I mean, he, it was wrong to beat the guy, you know, into a confession, and yet he knew he was guilty. And so, you know, like doing bad things for good reasons, that, that is a thing with Cooper. That's something Cooper has been shown that he is willing to do. And I think all intelligence people yeah. will do that. Yeah. You know, cops, so anyway, but cops I, are obliged to protocols. As all, all that, all that to say that I'm really excited that Cooper seems to have kind of adopted Tom via Liz and that he's going and he's getting <laughs> to meet Tom's real father. And that, that makes my heart very, very happy. Yeah. It's also interesting because there's, we're starting to see a little merge of the of the of the things, and I think that you know, um, Bunkin Camp was referring to it as a mini series, and I think you've had that theory that it's going to be just a one shot. I think it's gonna it's gonna last a few episodes, and it might go on after the blacklist is gone. But the blacklist was never meant to go on for thirteen seasons. No. You know, it has a uh, it has an arc. Six to seven seasons, I think he said was his sweet spot, something like that. Yeah. It was either six to seven or seven to eight. But at this point, I mean we're about to get a fifth season. Maybe we'll get a sixth. Um I hope. I mean but I, I do not want as much as I love the blacklist, as much as I love doing this podcast and doing everything that I do with this fandom I do not want it to go beyond the natural life. Exactly. Yeah. You should life ne- support is terrible. Like a certain show that I've been grumbling about privately to people <laughs> that I used to love. Like X Files. I go around and say it because for yeah. me it was X Files. I mean, for me, it's they should have time. killed yeah. that beast when he was good. <laughs> and and the last seasons were so painful to watch. It was just. It was just awful. There, there are a lot of shows that do that, and I get it. And, like, I, I listened to an interview that Boken Camp did, and he said that it's such a different beast writing for a TV series versus a movie. He said, you know, you go to a movie and you have the ending in mind and you pitch everything. He said when he pitched, you know, his first TV mm-hmm. series, I don't remember if it was Blacklist or if it was something else. I think it was Blacklist. No, that, it was something they, else. Oh, was it? Okay. That mm-hmm. He said, you know, well, here's my ending. They're like, don't give us an ending. You don't want to have this all tightly wrapped up because what if it goes further than you think it will? And so I, you know, that makes sense. It, it would be, for me, it'd be incredibly difficult because I'm a novelist. You know, I have everything set up. I have my nice little, you know, um, list of what I need to happen and fill everything in in between. But I think that some writers take that to such an extreme because they're getting pay- they're getting a steady paycheck. I mean, I, it's got to be such a different world than someone that just has their their eight to five job because once you wrap it, you've got to come up with something new to get another paycheck and and be able to sell it to get another paycheck. You know, I mean, to be able to. <laughs> keep the lights on (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so yeah i i understand why people do it but as as a consumer as a a fan and stuff the fans never want to see it the quality to go down for quantity no because also you you also diminish the value of the show in in syndication i mean a very tight show like uh that you know started had a beginning an ending i don't know if you ever saw the borges and on um on HBO, or, or you saw a House of Cards. It's like, think, well, they haven't finished House of Cards, but the Borges, they did finish. And it's it's important to finish when the story is done. Yeah. And and it I is. think that that's, they're not planning to do this. They're planning to keep things simple. Yeah. And I and agree. And I think that, that if we're going to probably get a season five and a season six. So that would be three episodes or three sets of Redemption, and if you make, if if you realize it just makes perfect sense, you do the next arc on who took Christopher, and the last arc is that merging of the two things together, which goes back to my crazy theory. Red wanted 
to have his own take on a private military operation, and the son in law will do just as well. Thank you. See, you you have some crazy theories out there. I don't consider that one one of your crazier ones. I, that makes total sense. Which is my because... craziest one, according to you? Carla is Katarina? Carla. <laughs> uh, I, I probably, that's not the one I disagree with most, because I, I don't, I'm not on board with it, but I'm also, mm. I'm also kind of like, well, if it happens, I'm going to give you major kudos. Like, I haven't completely written it off. The one I probably disagree with you most is you believing that Tom works with the CIA and that, you know, he's hidden this from Liz. And, like, I just, like, I, but I come at it from a, I think you and I come at that from such different points of view that. Yeah, I'm not might, a character analyst. Yeah, but... my, mine comes entirely from character analysis on that. And so it just. And it may be that, like, what we believe about that actually lines up more than we realize. <laughs> but because we come at it from such a different point of view, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it just... But hey, you don't have to agree on everything. I mean... <laughs> no, it's what makes... I mean, things are always being revised. That's a fun thing about a theory. You get a new episode, you get new new things. Either it confirms some things, or some things get scraped. And some things that get scraped get taken, like, like Tom's passport, out of the trash. Yeah. I had trash. My Carla was one of like of Katarina's identities. I had put it in that trash with Tom's passports, and then I started yeah, came. <laughs> back. And, oh, and I saw him like this is not that crazy. Of course, it I, looks crazy. I, I realize that. I've got a I've got a project I'm working on that I will finish up once Redemption, you know, wraps up the eighth episode, and it's because I had some very definite opinions about Tom's past, you know, leading up because after after we met young Jacob Phelps in season two, I didn't get the impression we were gonna get much more on Tom's past. That that, you know, just because he mm -hmm. he was a side character that we weren't going to get that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I certainly never hoped for a spinoff, good heavens. Um and so I had some very definite opinions about his past and headcans that I didn't think, you know, were ever gonna mm -hmm. get confirmed or denied. And I spent two years with these cementing themselves in my head, and some of them have come true with redemption, and some of them have been disproven with uh, redemption. And so, like, I, uh, I was there for in in a lot of foster homes. Yeah, yeah, the the foster homes is one of the big one because uh, I was convinced he was bouncing around. And I mean, looking back on it, you can tell they were assumptions made. Yes, I know why I made them, but it doesn't mean it's retconned. It just means they were assumptions that I made and I, I stuck to, you know, and held on for dear life. But I'm, I've got a project going right now where noting what I thought, how Canon's revised it, and how I feel about it. And so I'll, I'll post that once once Redemption That'd be is interesting. Airing. But yeah, it's fun because, I mean, it's it's... It's making me look at some of those things that I was very convinced of and very fond of. They were pet theories of mine that are mm -hmm. getting disproven. And honestly, I like what Redemption's done. I, I haven't found anything that makes me rear back and go, oh, I could have done so much better. You know, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, they're completely different than what I had in my mind, but that doesn't mean that they're worse. And it's it's very fun. It's very interesting to to make those shifts in your head, you know, and, and come to terms with what canon is. It's, it's enlightening. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I agree. I think, uh, um, it, uh, God knows my th crazy theories, you know, I always thought that Tom was working for a third employer and, you know, I, I thought that, you that, were that was one Katarina. of those. Yeah, a lot, I, of a lot of people still think that. I was the original that. one. I no, I wasn't not one of those. I was the the one. Oh, a lot of the new... antis feel that way because, like, I to this they, day, it's like if any new villain comes up, Tom must be working for them. And I'm like, are you done yet? <laughs> you know? Well, but my theory was another villain was like Katarina was looking out for 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 Liz. So when someone you know that she had even provided Tom Keen with the identity of Tom Keen and then that's why they knew him as Tom Keen. So that was that was my my theory and I had to, you know, as as we want and I was so firmly I had a whole different thing of the of that theory. It was like perfect. And then, you know, as we can and went on it's like, well, no. I mean no, I mean I can I could try to make crazy stuff, 
you know, if you really go at it with 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 a calm mind, you realize I was wrong. It, you know, it's nothing wrong with being wrong. It's what we do. Yep, and it's it's kind of refreshing to sit back and be able to to reevaluate. But anyway, anyway. I think that the <laughs> the blacklist is heading towards towards a definite ending. I would say six or seven seasons, depending on how much they get. I think they can wrap it up in a in a in a in a in a fifth if they were really pushed to it. Uh, and definitely, I think we will get another redemption. But I, I think the redemption think might go on afterwards, just because it's fun and light, and and they get the capers going. I wouldn't complain if it did. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's all right. So <laughs> wrapping it up. Um, I love how we said that like fifteen minutes ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. The so... wrap up need a wrap up. Yeah, the wrap-up of the wrap-up. It's, hey, you know, we get distracted. There's something shiny, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, you can catch us on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and YouTube. And if you want to leave us a message, which we always encourage, because we love to hear back from you guys, you can hear uh, just chat with us on Tumblr, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So, we will... Watch the uh, Tom and Solomon showdown next week. <laughs> yeah. Which I love how it, it we see that in the previews for next week, but then the it says that they go head-to-head in the finale, and you're like, oh my gosh, how many times are these guys going to go to blows? <laughs> mm-hmm. But I kind of like it. It's fun. Yeah. And so, till next week. We always love a bit, little bit of, of, uh, of violence in there. What can we say? <laughs> you know, as long as Tom comes out of it alive at the end, I'm okay. You can beat him up. Just make sure he's alive at the end of it. That's all I ask. <laughs> Until next week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.